Good morning. All right, so um, like I promised you, we're going to go through the practice test today. Um, don't forget that it is posted, right? So you've got until midnight tomorrow night to get that done. Um, let me know if you have any questions, though, or run into issues or anything like that. Um, we are going to try to get through as much of the practice test as possible. Um, you know, it is you know a two-hour test, so in 50 minutes we may or may not get through every problem, um, but I'll do my best to get through as much as we can. Okay. Um, I think that's all in terms of announcements, really. Um, oh, just make sure you know you're also working on the homework, um, the 4.5 and 4.6, because that's also due by midnight tomorrow night. Um, if you haven't finished that one yet, either. Okay. Um, those are the only thing to do. So just let me know if you've got any questions on any of that. And again, I'll be checking email and responding to questions and web assign and stuff uh, throughout the day today and tomorrow. Um, so send me those questions as you have them. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns before we get started now? All right, so if we take a look here at number one, we want to find the present value of $100,000 if interest is paid at a rate of 8% per year, compounded monthly for five years. Okay, and so it tells you in parentheses, this means find the initial investment that would produce a desired sum of $100,000. So first off, which formula are we going to use? All right, compound interest formula. In this, in this case, right, it's not continuously, it's monthly. So we're going to use the first one we looked at, right? So our formula this time is A of T is equal to P times 1 plus R over N to the NT. Okay, so make sure you know that formula um, because you will have to memorize that one for the test. All right, now, <clears throat> what are we going to do first? What information do we have this time? Okay, good. So the $100,000 is the A of T value, right? That's how much we're going to actually end up with. So we're going to set this now equal to 100,000 because we're trying to solve for what this time? We want to know what P is, right? We want to know what our investment's going to be. Then we have one plus, what's our R value this time? Good, right? Change that percent to a decimal, so that's 0 0.08. And then our N value is going to be what? 12, good. So we have the keyword right here, monthly. That tells us our N value is going to be equal to 12. We put 12 here. Same N value up in the exponent times our time, which is going to be what? Good, five years. So that's the setup for this one now, right? So we're setting it equal to 100,000, plugging everything else in that we know, and we're gonna try to solve this for P now. Now, in terms of actually solving this, what would you do next? Okay, good. We can go ahead and simplify what we have over here now. So we're going to have 100,000 equals P times, and it's kind of up to you. If you want to put all that right in the calculator um, and just see what you get, that's fine. So you do 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 12, and then raised to the 12 times 5. Again, just make sure the 12 times 5 is all in the exponent group together. You're going to want to keep several decimal places here um, just to make sure we're as accurate as possible in our final answer. This is going to give us 1.489845708. Okay. And again, the more decimal places you keep there, the better until we get to our final answer. Okay. So then once I have that, then we can do what? Divide, right? So we're just going to divide by that decimal now to get P by itself. So if we take 100,000 and we divide by that, what's that going to give us? OK, 
Okay, 67,121. And what should we actually round to in this case? The nearest cent, right? Which would round to what this time? Zero 0.04, good, so 0 0.04, and that would be our answer. Now, if you didn't keep as many decimal places right here, right, and when you divided, you were off by a dollar or something like that, as long as you show me all your steps, you're still gonna get full credit, right? But again, the more decimal places you can keep at that point, um, the closer your actual answer is gonna be to the correct answer. And just show me all your steps. Um, even if you round that number off a little bit, because um, then I can still give you credit so long as you, know, you show me how you got there. Any questions on that one now? All right, look at number two. This time we've got account A pays 2.5% APR compounded monthly and account B pays 2% APR compounded continuously. We wanna compare the growth rates to determine which account is more profitable. So we're basically just looking at, you know, if I invest money in this account A, how much would I make? If I invest in account B, how much would I make? And then which one is gonna make me more money? Okay, so how could we set up, let's start with account A this time. What formula are we going to have to use for account A? Same one as before, right? So this one we're compounding monthly, we're going to use that same formula. So how would we set this up then to figure out how much we're going to make with account A? So let's start with what we know, right? So what do we know in this case? All right, so we know it's 2.5%, we know it's monthly, right? So that tells us that our R value this time is 0 0.025, and monthly tells us again that our N value is gonna be 12. Now, that's all we know, right? We don't have a p-value, we don't have a t-value, but in this case, as long as you use the same p and t-values for account A and account B, it's not gonna matter what you use. Okay, so we can just choose any p-value we want, any investment, and we can choose any amount of time that we want as long as we keep it consistent from account A to account B. So what p-value do you wanna use this time? thousand dollars okay two dollars is fine too whatever you want to use is fine it's all going to work out the same okay and so we'll use a thousand dollars here then our formula is going to be one plus the r value 0 0.025 over the n value which is 12 and then we're going to do 12 times we need a t value how many years do you want to invest two okay another way to do this is just to let p be equal to one and let t be equal to one um, and find it that way right so if you just want to keep it simple that's fine too if you want to choose you know specific p and t values that's fine also now if we simplify this now again i can just go straight to the calculator at this point 1000 times 1 plus 0 0.025 over 12. i'm going to raise that to the 24th power 12 times 2. This right here gives me $1,051.22. Okay. Again, obviously, if you choose a different p-value and t-value, you're going to get a different number there. Perfectly fine, right? All I'm looking for is, are you using the correct formula? Um, and then did you choose you know, some values to substitute in there? And did you keep them consistent between the two accounts? That's the main thing. Now let's look at account B. What formula are we gonna have to use for account B? PERT, good, right? So what's our P value gonna be? We gotta use a thousand again, right? Since we invested a thousand in account A, we're also gonna invest a thousand there. And then we have our E, 
what's our R value going to be? Okay, be careful here, right? This time we're using account B, so make sure that you're using the rate from account B, which is actually going to be 0 0.02. So this is a mistake I see on this question a lot, right, is, you know, you kind of go back and use the same percentage for both, um, but make sure they gave you two different percentages, so make sure you're changing that decimal value, okay? All right, and then our time is going to have to be what? Two again, right? Since we used two for the first one, got to use two for this one also. And again, if we go to our calculator, it's going to do a thousand times E to the 0 0.02 times two. And if I do that now, get $1,040.81. Okay. All right. So then, based off of that, which account is going to be more profitable then? The reason we have to use PERT in this case is because it told us we are compounding continuously for account B. Okay, so as soon as you see that word continuously, that automatically tells you PERT. Okay. All right. And good, Alexander. It's going to be account A is more profitable. Account A more profitable. So make sure you answer that question, right? Because right? you're not just comparing them, you're actually saying which one is going to make us more money. So make sure you answer that. Any questions on that one now? Number three, okay, so there's three parts to this one, and we're just trying to evaluate each of these algebraically, right? So I don't want you just putting this in the calculator and getting an answer. I do want to see the steps along the way. So what could I do first if I want to solve that first logarithm algebraically? All right, good. Change it to exponential form, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just set this equal to some variable. So what would the exponential form look like then? Perfect. 3 to the x is equal to 1 over 27, right? So we're just using this, 3 to that power should be equal to that. All right, now that I've got it in exponential form, if I want to know what x is equal to, what would I do then? So remember on problems like this, if we can get the same base on both sides, that's what we're going to want to do because then we can just set the exponents equal. Could I get the same base on both sides of this equation? Three, right? So I could rewrite 27 as three to the what power? three to the negative three in this case because it's in the denominator, right? So if you want to put that intermediate step, three to the third gives us 27. Because it's in the denominator, I can make it a negative. So now we have three to the X equals three to the negative three. And then once we have the same base on both sides, then we can say what?
Good, just x equals negative three. So this is the value for that logarithm now. Those are the steps I would wanna see, right? Is changing it to exponential form, getting that common base on both sides so that then you can set the exponents equal to each other. Any questions on that one now? So look at the next one now. Okay, so same thing. I'm going to use a variable here. I'll call this y just so we're not using x again. I'm going to rewrite this in exponential form, which is going to be 2 to the y equals 0.25. Okay, so then what would we want to do next if we're trying to get the same base on both sides here? All right, it is going to be base 2. What's another way that I could write 0.25? One-fourth, right? So let's go ahead and convert that to one-fourth. So then this is just 2 to the y equals 1 over 4. Now it's very similar to the previous one, right? Because I can rewrite 4 as 2 to what power? Two squared, right? Two to the second. Then because it's in the denominator, just like the other one, I can rewrite that as a negative exponent. So we'll have two to the negative two, which means then that y is equal to what this time? Negative two, good. So that's our answer for that logarithm. Not every single step, no, right? So the main things I want to see is, did you convert it to exponential form? Did you find a common base on both sides? And then did you set the exponent equal to that on both sides, right? That's Those are kind of the three steps I really need to see. Okay. Any other questions there? All right, part C, again, I'm going to choose a variable. I'll go with Z this time. That's so going to be one-third to the Z equals nine. All right, so what's our common base going to be this time? Three, good. So how can I rewrite one third with a base of three? Three to the negative one, good. So I'm gonna write three to the negative one, raised to the Z. And then if we change nine with a base of three, what would that be? Not three to the third, but three squared. Good. Right. Three squared. Good. All right. So then what can we do at this point? All right, good. So when we raise a power to a power, we multiply those exponents. So this is really just three to the negative Z equals three squared. Then I can set the negative Z equal to two. And then when I solve for Z, then that's gonna give us what? Two. 
Negative two, good. There we go. Okay. And again, I don't have to see every single one of those steps, right? <clears throat> but as long as you show me the exponential form, show me that you know how to find the common base, um, and then you solve for the exponent, that's what I'm looking for there. Any questions on that one? Okay, number four, domain. <clears throat> All right, so we got to think about any restrictions that we would have on the domain of this function now. So what's one thing we're going to have to look at for domain? Okay, so what restrictions will we have to look at for this one? What do we have in here that would give us restrictions? Square root, right? So anytime you got a square root, what do we know about the stuff inside the square root? Can't be less than zero, right? So in this case, I'm gonna say that X minus two has to be greater than or equal to zero, because I could have a zero inside of a square root. I just can't have any negatives, right? So x minus two has to be greater than zero, which means that x has to be greater than or equal to <clears throat> positive two, excuse me. All right, now let's think about the logarithm. What do we know about the stuff inside of a logarithm? Okay, it can't be negative. Can it be zero? No, because remember, a vertical asymptote at zero. So in this case, everything that's inside of the logarithm now, 25 oops, minus x squared has to be strictly greater than zero, right? So the restriction on the square root greater than or equal to zero, Restrictions on logarithms, though, strictly greater than zero. Now, how would I solve that inequality? About what can we do with 25 minus x squared? It's a difference of squares, right? So how is that going to factor? Good. 5 minus x and 5 plus x. Start with that. And I remember with these inequalities, right, if they're not linear, um, like the first one, we could just move the two over and get x by itself, right? In this case, we can't do that because of the x squared. So we find our factors. Then we're going to have to create a number line so we can test points and see where it's actually positive and negative. I'm going to take each one of these factors now, set it equal to zero. And that would give us what two values for our number line? Good. This gives us x equals positive 5, and this is going to give us x equals negative 5. Then I'm going to do my number line so that I can test and see where this thing is positive and where it's negative. So what's the value I could choose in that first interval to test? Negative 6 works. And you can go back and plug it in anywhere in that inequality, right? Either the very first step or the factors. I'm actually going to plug it in up here this time to the very first step. So we'll do 25 minus negative 6 squared. Okay, first step here would be to do the exponent. So what's negative 6 squared going to give us? 36. 
and then is 25 minus 36 going to be a positive or a negative value? It's going to be negative, right? So everything here now is going to be a negative. All right, what's something I could choose between negative 5 and 5? Two works. So we'll do 25 minus 2 squared. Again, do your exponent first here. 2 squared is 4, so we have 25 minus 4. Is that going to be positive or negative? It's going to be a positive, right? So everything in here now is going to be positive. <clears throat> and then finally, we need something bigger than 5. So what can we test there? 6 is good. We'll do 25 minus 6 squared. Again, do your exponent first. 25 minus 36, is that going to be positive or negative? Negative again, just like the first one. So that's negative. Now, do we want positives or negatives this time? We want positives, right? We wanted this to be greater than zero, which means we want the positives. So now we know that we're somewhere between negative five and five. But we also have to consider this piece that said that x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So what would our interval notation look like if we were to put all that together now? All right, so be careful here, right? We want to be greater than or equal to 2, but also between negative 5 and 5, there we go. It's going to have to be a bracket 2 to 5 with a parenthesis. Right? And the reason we're using parentheses on the 5 is because this one was strictly greater than 0, not greater than or equal to, so we don't want to include the 5. With the 2, though, it was greater than or equal to 2, so we're going to include the 2, and that would be the overlap now, right? If I were to kind of sketch these out, that might be helpful. We're basically saying we're somewhere between negative 5 and 5. And then 2 would be right here. So if I shade this graph greater than or equal to 2, and then I look at the interval between negative 5 and 5, the overlap between those two now is everything from 2 to 5, including the 2, because that's included on both, but not including the 5, because that's not included on both. And so our interval here is from 2 to 5. Any questions about how I got that interval now? All right, number five. And so again, we're looking at domain. This time we only have a natural log, right? So what do we know about the stuff inside that natural log? So what do we just say on number four about the stuff inside the natural log? Okay, can't be zero or less than zero, right? So strictly we're going to have that x cubed minus x squared minus 2x is greater than zero. Okay. Now, how would we go about solving this? Good. Factor out the x first, right, because we have that common factor. That'll leave us with x squared minus x minus 2. Then we can look at what's left in here. What would be the factors that would give us that?
Good, x minus two and x plus one. Right, now, once we have those factors, then we can do what? Good, set them equal to, so we're gonna have x equals zero, x minus two equals zero, x plus one equals zero. Well, the first value is zero. This one's gonna give us two, and this one's gonna give us negative one. Once we have those values, now we can do what? Number one, good. Just like the previous one, right? We're gonna do our number line test. The smallest value this time is negative one. Zero's next, then our two. <clears throat> All right, so now we need a value somewhere less than negative one. So what can we test there? Negative two works. And again, you can plug it into the original or to the factored form. This time I'll go with the factored form. So I have negative two times negative two minus two times negative two plus one. Just looking at each of our factors now, I know negative two is a negative. Negative two minus two is gonna be a negative. And negative two plus one is also gonna be a negative. So overall, what's that gonna give us? It's gonna be negative, right? We have an odd number of negatives here, so that interval is gonna be negative. Okay. What's something between negative one and zero? Negative 0.5, good. So we're gonna plug that in, so I have negative 0.5 times negative 0.5 minus two times negative 0.5 plus one. And again, I'm just gonna go through and figure out my signs. Negative 0.5 is a negative. Negative 0.5 minus two is also gonna be a negative. Negative 0.5 plus one, that actually comes out positive. And so overall that interval is gonna be what? This time positive, right? We have two negatives, that's an even number of negatives. So that interval is gonna be positive. What value can we choose between zero and two? One works. Plug that in. One times one minus two times one plus one. This time one is positive on the outside. One minus two is gonna give us a negative and one plus one is a positive. So overall, what are we gonna get this time? This time it's a negative, right? We only have the one negative. That's an odd number of negatives, so we get a negative. And then finally, we need something in that last interval. So what can we use there? Three works. Now we have three times three minus two, three plus one. Three is a positive. 3 minus 2 is also positive. 3 plus 1, positive. So overall, this one's going to be what? Positive. Good. Right, now, again, we care about which values, positives or negatives. Positives, right? We want this to be greater than 0. So we know we want the positive. So we have this one here and this one here this time. So what's our interval notation going to look like? Okay, good, negative one to zero. And then our other interval is gonna be from two to infinity, perfect. And notice in this case, we're not including any of the values, right? Because this was strictly greater than zero. So none of those values are included and it's just the interval from negative one to zero and then the interval from two to infinity. Any 
Any questions about how we got that? Number six, when you use our laws of logarithms here, okay, to simplify this and solve it algebraically. So what can we do using our laws of logarithms this time? Okay, good. So in this case, we have a subtraction, which is going to change to division. We have an addition, which changes to multiplication. So when I rewrite this one now, they're all base two logs, which is what allows me to combine them. We're going to have six divided by 15 and then times 20. Now, if we simplify what we've got inside the log now, 6 divided by 15 times 20 is going to give us what? It's going to be 8. Good. So we end up with base 2 log of 8. And so then how would we solve that? Okay, you could. This one we can actually do by hand, right? So we'll convert it to exponential form. This is like two to some power is equal to eight. What would be our common base this time? Two, right? Because we can rewrite eight as two to what power? Two to the third. And that tells us then that X is equal to three. And so that is our answer. Right. If you got to this point and you just said, oh, yeah, I know that 2 to the third is equal to 8, so my answer is 3, I'm fine with that. Right? If you don't convert this one to exponential form, okay, but I need to see that you combine them into a single logarithm using the division and multiplication, simplify what's inside, and then just evaluate what that logarithm is at that point. Okay. Any questions on that one now? All right, number seven. Okay, so we want to use our laws of logarithms this time to work backwards and actually expand this out. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the first thing I would do when I see this square root around everything is I would convert this to a fractional exponent. So how could we rewrite the square root with a fractional exponent? One half power, right? So I'm going to rewrite this now as the log of all of this stuff raised to the one half. So I have x squared plus four over x squared plus 1 times x cubed minus 7 squared, all raised to the 1 half power. All right, now we want to apply our laws of logarithms. Okay, so what's one thing I could do in this case? Okay, we can bring the one half all the way to the front now, right? So we'll have one half times the log of, and then we're just going to be left with this fraction, x squared plus 4 over x squared plus 1 times x cubed minus 7 squared. Okay. Now what can we do? Okay, good. The division is going to become subtraction, right? So we'll have one half. I'm going to make sure that one half stays out front of everything, even once I split this up now. So it's log of x squared plus 4 minus the log of x squared plus 1 
times x cubed minus 7 squared. Okay. Now what? Okay, good. The multiplication can be split up using addition now. So we have one half of our log of x squared plus four minus. Now be careful here. We have to put another grouping symbol around this once we separate it since this entire thing was being subtracted. I'm going to put an extra set of parentheses here. Say log of x squared plus one plus the log of x cubed minus seven squared. It's going to look like that. So again, since we were subtracting that entire logarithm with the multiplication in it, we have to subtract everything even once we split it into addition. Okay, so the one half, are, are we talking about like up here at the very first step? Okay, so whenever you have a square root, remember, like if you had the square root of x, another way to write that is x to the one half power, because the index, which is a two, becomes the denominator, right, and the exponent, the one, becomes the numerator. So I just took that entire square root and wrote it as a one half. Yep. Any other questions? Now, there's only really one other thing we can do now. So what's the last thing we can move? Uh, anybody else have a black screen? Same. Same, same, yes, yes, yes. All right, give me one second. Let me see if I can fix that. Is it back now? All good? Perfect. All right. All right, so now, what's the only other thing we can do at this point? Good, right? So we have this 2 as an exponent on that last logarithm. We can move that to the front. So then we'll have 1 half times the log of x squared plus 4 minus the log of x squared plus 1 plus 2 times the log of x cubed minus 7. And that would be our answer now. Now, if you wanted to, right, you could distribute the negative inside there to each of those logarithms at the end. You could also distribute the 1 half to every single logarithm. Um, but as long as you've expanded it as far as you possibly can, Right. There's no other multiplication that you can split using addition or subtraction. There's no other exponents that can be moved at this point. Okay, then I'm good with that answer right there. But if you did distribute anything, right, and got an equivalent answer, right, you'd still get full credit for that also. Any questions on that one now? All right, number eight. Okay, so we want to find a solution, and we're going to give an exact value, which means we don't want any decimals along the way. We want to keep everything in log form as we go. Okay, so notice this time we cannot get a common base on both sides. So what's the only way we're going to be able to solve this one now? Logarithms, right? Okay, and it doesn't matter if you use a common log or a natural log. Okay, I prefer natural logs personally, but I'm going to, whatever you want to use is fine. I'm just going to take the natural log of both sides here. So we'll get 2 to the 3x plus 1, and then take the natural log of 3 to the x minus 2. So again, anytime you have x's in the exponent and you can't get a common base on both sides, we have to use logarithms. Now, once we do that, now what can we do?
Good. Now we can move our exponents to the front. So that 3x plus 1, I'm going to keep that group together here. That gets moved to the front of this log. And the x minus 2, same thing. I'm going to keep it grouped together. That gets moved to the front of that log. All right. Now, what would our next step need to be? All right, good. So we need to get all the x terms together. Now, before we can do that, what are we going to have to do first? We need to distribute. Good. So let's distribute first so that we can get all the x terms together. Because right now, with these parentheses, we're not going to be able to get all the x's together. So I'm going to take this natural log of 2 here, and I'm going to distribute it to everything inside that parentheses. So that's going to give us 3x times the natural log of 2 plus, and then natural log of 2 times 1 is just natural log of 2. Then we'll do the same thing on the other side. So I'm going to take the natural log of 3, I'm going to distribute it to both of these terms here. So that's going to give us x times the natural log of 3 minus 2 times the natural log of 3. Any questions up to that point? Now, I need to get all the x terms together, right, and everything else I can move to the other side. So I'm going to subtract x times the natural log of 3 so that I can move it over here with this other x term. So now we have 3x natural log of 2 minus x times the natural log of 3 plus the natural log of 2 equals negative 2 natural log of 3. Then on the left-hand side, I have that natural log of 2 that doesn't have an x in it. I'm going to move that to the other side by subtracting it. So I have 3x natural log of 2 minus x times the natural log of 3 equals negative 2 natural log of 3 minus the natural log of 2. So basically move the natural log of 2 to the right, move the x natural log of 3 to the left, so that you get all your x terms on one side, everything else on the other side. Now what can we do? Okay, so we actually don't need to combine the logs at this point. So you, you could, right? You could use your laws of logarithms and actually combine and everything, okay, but we don't actually need to do that, and we can actually get an answer pretty easy from here on. Okay, so what can we do now? I'm trying to solve for x. Good, right? So we know we have a common factor of x here, so I'm going to factor it out. So we got x times, that first term is just going to leave us with 3 natural log of 2. Second term here is just going to be minus natural log of 3. And on the other side, we have all this other stuff now. So again, that's the whole reason for getting all those x terms together is so we can then factor out the x because then our last step is going to be what? Just divide, right? So divide by everything in the parentheses here to get the x by itself. So we're just going to end up with negative 2 natural log 3 minus the natural log of 2 over 3 natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 3. This is our exact value for x now. So again, I don't want any decimals here. Make sure you're keeping those logs throughout the problem, and that would be our value. 
So why wouldn't multiplying and dividing work to move the logs and X's without distributing? Um, it, it would, but just keep in mind, if you did that, um, you would end up with something that looks like this, 3X plus one over X minus two is equal to the natural log of three over the natural log of two, right? And the problem there is now you've got a rational function on the left-hand side, and it's going to be really difficult to solve that for X. So that's why we distribute first so that we can get all the X terms together and factor out that X. Otherwise, you're going to end up with that fraction, and it's going to be really difficult to solve for X at that point. Okay. I know we're out of time, right? So we'll stop there. Um, you can definitely look at my answer key, right, for the rest of these. Um, send me questions through email. If you do have any questions, I'll be happy to explain anything that I've done there. Um, but we will stop there for today. Again, don't forget the test is due by midnight tomorrow night. It is already posted, so you can get started on it whenever you want to. Um, and then also don't forget the 4.5 and 4.6 homework, if you haven't finished that already, um, is also due by midnight tomorrow night, okay? Have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Monday.